We're talking with Robin Broad and John Cavana. It is a very important day for me to be speaking to you both because your book, The Water Defenders, I think is a ray of hope that we all need right now. I don't think as a journalist well over 40 years, I don't think I've ever witnessed such a depressing news cycle. And then I get a copy of your book, which I finished reading last night. And I think, my goodness, there is hope. There is hope. So, first of all, I don't mind which one of you begins. How did you both individually first hear about El Salvador? I'm talking particularly the country, not the water crisis. John, do you want to start with how we heard about El Salvador and how you're the next? Great. No, thank you, Claudia, for for having us and, and for the ray of hope there. Yes, I heard about El Salvador the way most people in the United States heard about it in the 1980s, which is that Ronald Reagan was elected. He decided that the greatest threat to American security were communists in Central America, and he focused in on Nicaragua and El Salvador. And I worked at the Institute for Policy Studies at that time, and and I worked with others to try to prevent the United States government from pouring money into right-wing dictatorships. And there was one in El Salvador. uh, And we spent a great deal of time, actually tens of thousands of people in the United States got involved in that effort to try to stop US support for really what was a death squad government during a long, a 12 year civil war in that country. So that was my first interaction with with El Salvador. Robin. Well, it, it, here's a good point to say that John and I happen not only to be co-authors, but we're married. Oh, we know where so, you're married. It's a formidable duo. <laughs> but we've been, we, we met in graduate school decades ago. And so our experiences are, are very similar in terms of how we heard about El Salvador and how we became involved. I should also add that we live, we live just outside of, of Washington, D.C., and like many communities around the U.S., there is a very large community of people who came from El Salvador and other countries in Central America during the Salvadoran Civil War and, and the other um, wars where the U.S. the U.S. supported not the, the the more conservative death squad side. So it was also it was around us in in our community. But and this may be jumping ahead, so I won't do it yet. But but we really we never expected to be involved for over ten years with with El Salvador um, as, as intimately as we were in the tale we re- retell in this book. We had lived in the Philippines. We know the Philippines well. Um, and then this, this just fell into our laps, if you will, by either fate or serendipity. Now, John, you mentioned uh, the policy, American policy towards the, uh, the Latin America, South America, the, the southern part of the continent of America. But this is actually a legacy, is it not, of the Monroe Doctrine. James Monroe, uh, best known towards his policy, saying that European nations uh, must be aware that the US will not tolerate further colonization or puppet monarchs, which is very ironic because it's precisely what it went on to do, which tolerate uh, autocrats. So... Can you give me, because your Institute of Policy Studies, some idea of how this is a legacy of colonialism and an attempt at American imperialism, in fact? Because we're seeing this today in Afghanistan. What, what is it about what happened in El Salvador that rings, you know, quite alarmingly familiarly today? Yeah, beautiful question. Uh, Unfortunately, in U.S. history, the U.S. expanded, obviously, across this great continent, um, committed genocide against Native people in the 1860s to 1890s, and then 
and then got to California, partly through gold, part of this story. Beyond that, though, there was an ambition to, to go further. And so we're now 120 years past the American imperial experiment, but the US went to the Philippines, it went to Cuba, and the US in essence reaffirmed what Monroe had said, which is the US position to, the, to Europe and the rest of the world was this is our backyard. What happens particularly in Central America, but in Latin America overall is is, has to come by the United States. This is our sphere of influence. We will get our bananas from there. We'll get our coffee from there. And we will, if we see regimes we don't like, we will intervene and overthrow them. So US history is replete with interventions in Haiti, in Nicaragua, and then supporting uh, forces in countries like El Salvador that were conservative, would protect US corporate interests. And, and truly the US for 200 years has seen this part of the world as its own quote, backyard. That just for a second, since you raised Afghanistan, that kind of hubris did spread to other parts of the world. The US massively spent resources. We spend over half of our discretionary budget on the military. And uh, we saw, Afghanistan is a place which again, there was activity there we didn't like. It was, we, we claimed that it was a spawning ground for terrorism and that same hubris that we could go in there, change regimes uh, and determine what happened there. Um, that hubris spread from, from Latin America to places like Afghanistan. And we're seeing the folly of it today in Afghanistan, just as we saw the folly of it in El Salvador in, in the 1980s. And that folly is very hard to undo. Now, Robin, you are a professor of international development and you have an extraordinary background where you rethink globalization and focus on environment and uh, social economic accountability. Again, that very much applies to Afghanistan and the unfolding day block. What are your thoughts as an activist, uh, this international development aspect of your profound career? We are witnessing a regressive step, even if the Taliban claim to not be as bad as they have been, and we have no evidence that they won't be every bit as bad. Do you have, bearing in mind all your background, bearing in mind your book, Water Defend Defenders, this lesson that perhaps people listening can take part in somehow stemming the tide of what many see as inevitable destruction. Well, thank you, Claudia. Thank you again for having us on the show and thank you for your overly complimentary words. So obviously this is, this is a huge question you've asked and there's no easy answer. Um, I think the key thing to understand is that we have a, we, we the US government, um, has a history that we haven't learned from yet. We haven't learned the lessons of what to do right and what we've done wrong in countries, be it El Salvador or Afghanistan. We, we have a, we, in our culture, if I can make such a grandiose statement, there's there's something in our culture from our manifest destiny state days, as you put it, imperialism, where we think that we know best and we can go around and make the world a better place um, through, be it through military intervention and putting in place governments that we, that the U.S. government thinks are are will be good for for U.S. interests or whether it, as we document in this book, um, whether it's supporting global corporations as they move into economically poorer countries and economically poorer communities, um, we seem to have a belief that trade, investment, anything that comes from the US or our economically richer allies, that that will bring good. And we, we really haven't, we, we need to step back and ask, how do we do this in a different way? And that's part of what John and I retell in this book is how we, with our background in the Philippines and, and other, uh, and, and building alliances 
with communities in other places, how we moved forward and played, we played a minor role, the people in El Salvador played the major role, but how we did this, if you will, partnership in different ways, rather than us defining the terms, we define them together. And we didn't say, we know Johnny and I certainly didn't say, and the group we helped found called International Allies, we didn't say, we know what's best for El Salvador. We said, you, the coalition of water defenders in El Salvador, you have the expertise on El Salvador. You decide what you want for El Salvador. In this case, it was to ban all, all metals mining to save their, their water. Um, but we said, and we said, we will follow your lead on that. But we, we, it's our problem too. It's our challenge because we, it's, it's a global problem. It's global corporations. In this case, it was a, a really nasty lawsuit at the World Bank Group, which happens to be based in Washington, D.C. John and I live just two blocks outside of Washington, D.C. And the coalition of water defenders in El Salvador um, thought that made a lot of sense. So they took that, the global expertise from us, and we took the Salvadoran expertise from them, um, rather than defining, rather than us, us defining what should be done in their own country. Yes, and that's an important example. I want to make a small point, but actually it's a massive point, I think, in, in terms of what you're going to tell me as an answer. The subtitle for your book is How Ordinary People Saved a Country from Corporate Greed. And I would argue, John and, and Robin, that it's not just corporate greed. Again, Afghanistan, it's the military-industrial complex of greed. And you mentioned the World Bank. And we see what they did in El Salvador. Do you think using the word corporate enough is all embracing enough for the tentacles that came down from this company, this gold mining company? It wasn't simply a company. This isn't just corporate, is it? No, it's very, very well put, Claudia. In a way, I think what, what is going on here, what Robin and I discovered, and we've discovered this over the years, is that there's a famous quotation of a US corporate executive in the 1950s, Charlie Wilson, who testified before the US Congress. And he said, what's good for General Motors is good for the United States and vice versa. And by that, he was asking the US government to support it as it moved around the world, opened up new factories, sold its cars all over, it was saying, look, this is good for the United States, so support us. And what we've seen over the past 50 to 60 years in the US, we've seen this in many European countries, also in Canada, is that large parts of the government get linked up with large corporations in this hubris that, that you and Robin just described that suggests that whatever those companies want to do is going to be good for everybody. That's the conceit of, of the United States in many ways and what's led us into all of these, these debacles. But that's what we watched in, in Central America. In other words, the US government in, in El Salvador was saying, what can we do to help these companies prosper? Now, they did say they thought that that would let everybody prosper. But what this story is about is, is really why that, that tends to bring benefits to the few, the rich in a country like El Salvador, the corporations and the wealthy in a country like the United States. And our argument was, no, the US government is supposed to be a government of, by, and for the people. It should not blindly support big corporations. It should listen to, as we try to in, in this 10-year story, it should take its lead from people on the ground. If we say we're supporting farmers in Afghanistan or farmers in El Salvador, let them tell us what would be good for them. And I'll just give you one quick example. In northern El Salvador, there's a giant road that goes across the country that nobody takes because it doesn't connect the little towns. Instead, it was built largely for the mining companies so that they could get the gold quickly to the ports. A great deal of money was spent on it, US taxpayer money. Now, 
some of it loans being repaid by the Salvadorans. No one in El Salvador benefited. At the end of this story, of course, El Salvador, the people of El Salvador pressed their government to become the first in the world to ban mining to save its rivers. And so they win, and yet there's this giant monument to US hubris, this road that nobody's taking because it doesn't connect anything. And that's, that's the folly. And one hopes that when you elect a government like Joe Biden, that more people will come into that government who will listen. And I think the jury, unfortunately, is still out as to whether or not that will be the case. Robin, well, before I ask you the next question, I just want to say, of course, that what you're both saying equally applies to fracking, to Halliburton, to the discussion that fracking is good for people, it will make communities rich regardless of the proprietary liquid that Halliburton uses and I believe still refuses to disclose even though it's so it's a very similar story El Salvador and Halliburton's efforts alleged efforts in the United States refracking if I could just add to that that is absolutely absolutely correct and much as we were involved and wanted to retell the story of these two amazing victories um, by the, the people of El Salvador. Um, we wouldn't have written this book if it was only about El Salvador and if we're, the lessons were only for El Salvador. This book could be about fracking. It could be about big pharma. It could be about a big box store. It could be about Exxon Mobil. This is, a, as, you, as you put it, this is a book about if, um, with apologies to Margaret Mead, about uh, how a small group of ordinary but extraordinary people um, decided to do what was right, what was in the best interests of the common good although the odds were stacked incredibly against them because they were fighting both, as you say, where they were fighting corporate power, but they were fighting corporate power that was supported by the US and other governments, the Canadian government especially. Um, so this was a, a, big, a big challenge they took on. And we wrote the book both to retell the story but above all, Robin, this is a story about people, local people. And Juan Marcelo, his disappearance and murder, this is in a small town in the northern mountains of El Salvador. And men in white, white men in suits arrive. White men in suits with a racist audacity that only corporates can have going into a small town in the northern mountains of El Salvador. The suits alone give away the idea that they had come to impose a corporate regime that they had decided would be the benefit for people in El Salvador, but above all, for benefit of the gold mine they work for. So tell me about Marcelo's disappearance and murder and the first day that you got to the northern mountains of El Salvador. So that, that, Claudia, is, of course, how we begin the book. And we begin the book with Marcelo's murder because we wanted the reader to begin where we had begun in this story, with the horrifying realization that murder can be the cost of protecting the environment in other countries. Johnny and I knew that people disproportionately poor and people of color are killed by what has been called the slow violence of chemical poisoning of their air, their land and water, by global mining, by agribusiness, by fossil fuel firms. Yet in the US, seldom do people get murdered, get tortured and murdered for leading these fights for water, for environmental justice. Um, as there's a, a, a very fine nonprofit called Global Witness, and it is the best source of documentation on this murder, these murders. And as it reminds us, hundreds of people around the world are assassinated every year simply because they're environmental defenders. Often, they are not just the poorest economically, but they're also indigenous peoples. Um, Marcelo Rivera was one of these. And his death, his, his murder that occurred in mid-2009 was what brought us into this book and what haunted us enough 
to to write this book that in some ways is it's a much larger story but uh, at its core it's a tribute to him and his life the thing is you're not white men in suits but you are american which is almost synonymous to people in small towns in you were gringos you were foreign what i'm curious about is when you got there literally the first day and you stayed in a hotel and you check in and you're there to do an an almost seemingly impossible job at that time what was the immediate reaction people how did you persuade people in that town that you were there to help you know we had a great advantage claudia that most americans would not have we met Marcelo because my institute had chosen this group of water defenders to receive a human rights award in 2009. Five were set to come, including Marcelo. Then we learned that Marcelo has been assassinated. We, of course, are, are, are shocked. They bring in his place his brother. So Robin and I spent three days with Miguel Rivera, his brother, Vitalina Morales, and others in Washington in the fall of 2009. They asked us to set up a tour of the US and Canada so they could tell their stories. They pulled us into the story. They asked for our help. So when we first went to El Salvador the first time and then went up to the town of Marcelo and Miguel, we were seen as trusted friends, something that most Americans going into a poor country do not have. They knew we were there as allies. They knew that we had information that could help them and they knew that we needed to learn more of the story. So that first visit began 10 years of building friendship, building trust, something that the United States, by the way, never did in Afghanistan or El Salvador. And so there's a lot of lessons for this, I think, for the US and the US government. But if you build trust and you are there truly listening to them, they, it's interesting, uh, Claudia, they, most of these fights, people just want to kick out the company and save their, their water. Gold is, uses cyanide to separate the gold from the rock. They learn very quickly that this would poison their rivers. And so normally the goal is just to kick out the mining company. In this case, they had the audacity <laughs> to suggest that mining would be dangerous for the whole country and they wanted to kick it out completely. We, though, as Americans, we, we didn't say we think this is audacious. We said, OK, <laughs> what can we do to help? And so that created something that I think most people from the US don't have in, in a country like El Salvador, which was trust and, and partnership. Yes, and Robin, you with the personal on the ground relationships with people, you go into it a lot in the book, but tell me some of the most surprising aspects of actually when you got there? Well, so that is that is another great question. And um, let me just go back for a minute to say the term white, white men in suits that, that you use, and thank you for using a term that, that's in our book. That is a, a quote from a, a person on the ground in, in Northern El Salvador. So that's not a term we made up. That's the term that he used, this water defender, when he described the miners, the mining executives. So he didn't say gringos, he said white men in suits. And it's very interesting because we actually don't know what they were wearing. We assume they were wearing suits, but it was, it was said as if to differentiate um, it was said as if to say, we, they didn't say all gringos are bad. But these white men in suits were, and that was actually the, a funny story that began because when he told us the story of white men in suits, he said the white men in suits, the mining executive, came in and said they were looking for mines. And he, this man who had lived through the, the Civil War, said to the white men in suits, he said, oh, the UN has already been through here and cleared up all the landmines. At that point, he didn't even know what kind, that, that those white men in suits were looking for gold mines. It was only in that conversation where it became clear to him and his, his townsmates that these white men in suits were looking to, to mine in that province. And that began 
this incredible um, exploration that we retell in the book of how these very ordinary people, and we use the word ordinary to say that ordinary people can do extraordinary things. They tend to do extraordinary things. These very these these townspeople who were originally were originally intrigued by mining. These are poor provinces in northern El Salvador. Some of the people were very excited, understandably, at the prospect of jobs. And then they began a series of research trips, including to just over the big river, the Lempa River into Honduras, where they saw the social, environmental, and economic impact of mining. They learned that mining poisons the land and the rivers. They learned that mining brings terrible conflict, including the death of people like Marcelo Rivera. And they learned that even in terms of economic benefits, mining at best brings short-term jobs to just, to not that many people in local communities. What is compelling about your book is uh, the white men in suits plus gold plus cyanide. Now, gold is just greed. It, there's, there's no mistake. This was gold mining. It was a run for money. We see it all over the world, South Africa particularly, the exploitation of people for filthy lucre. But then you have cyanide. I would wager that even small children, anybody who's ever watched a, a thriller or Hitchcock, cyanide, I don't know that he did actually mention cyanide, but cyanide poisoning in terms of the imagination, is one of the most evil associations. So we get these white men in suits coming to persuade impoverished people that poisoning their water supply with cyanide for money, for gold equals money, that they will not get is a good idea. That is the part of the story that I find most reprehensible, that they were able to hide the evil that would necessarily come from the cyanide to get the gold. And those powers of persuasion to exploit poor people, what were the kind of points people made to you about how they were being duped before their ultimate victory? What, what did people say to you? Now, how could we be so stupid? Or they were so persuasive? Or we thought we'd all be rich? Tell me some of that, both of you, please. The dynamic that they described to us on the ground is that the mining executives came in and said, look, we can both give you jobs, but also make you rich. 1% of our profits will come back to the local community. It actually goes to the local government. And they said, Yes, we use cyanide, but cyanide is safe. Now, I think they were counting on the fact, it's fascinating what you said about cult popular culture, Claudia. So if you've watched a James Bond movie or a World War II spy thriller, yes, cyanide is there. It's what you take to kill yourself quickly if you're captured. I think they were counting on the fact that, that people in Northern El Salvador would not have seen those movies. And people did not know immediately that cyanide was bad. They learned that as they visited their, their companions in Honduras, as they went to the east of the country, and they saw its impacts. They saw it, it killing fish and rivers and so on. I think, though, also the white men in suits, this is something that came through as we went through their documents. They refused to to, inter, to let us interview them, but we got a treasure trove of their documents. They thought of these people, as one of the water defenders put it, as ignorant farmers with big hats. And they thought if they simply used the language of we're green miners, we're sustainable miners, there is an incident where they say, look, we'll drink cyanide in a, in a, in a liquid and you'll see how safe it is. And the, the farmers, the water defenders press them to get real authenticated cyanide and then they backed off. They thought these were ignorant farmers in big hats and they could sell them with the promises of huge riches. It's extraordinary. But then I'm going to have to focus quite narrowly now on Pat Crim, the gold mining, gold mining company concerned, claimed, and I think this, this has ramifications for Citizens United and so many other legal decisions that 
a government could not adopt environmental rules that deprived a corporation of future profits. I'm going to say that again because it's really unfathomable. A government, i.e. El Salvador, could not adopt environmental rules, protections for their people from the poisoning of cyanide, that deprived a corporation, a foreign corporation, of exploitative future profits. That is at the heart of your book. Explain. Well, Claudia, as, as outrageous as your statement sounds, it is absolutely true. We, in trade agreements, um, going back to the Reagan years and in, a, in an international court that's at the World Bank Group going back 60 years, the global economic rules say that, say precisely that that a government cannot put in place social regulations, environmental regulations, economic regulations that deprive a corporate, a global company of future profits when, um, for an agreed upon investment. Now, what's interesting here is that this is a secretive venue in the World Bank Group in Washington, DC. It's an arbitration venue. Corporations can sue governments, governments can't sue corporations, and communities like those of Marcelo and Miguel can't sue the corporations either, they're not involved. The corporations almost always win in this venue. It's an expensive venue, either they win or the governments are so worried that they're going to lose that they agree to some kind of compromise before the case is even settled. In this case, a Canadian company called Pacific Rim, which was subsequently bought up by a Canadian Australian company, Oceana Gold, sued El Salvador for not letting it mine. Now, they were so sure they would win, Pac Rim and its corporate lawyers, that they, they missed the fact, they overlooked, they intentionally overlooked the fact that they didn't yet have a mining agreement. They had, did not have a final agreement to mine. They, hadn't had, they didn't have an approved environmental impact assessment. And they thought, as happened in most cases, that El Salvador would simply cave and that they would win. They sued for $300 million, which is a phenomenal amount, especially when you think about the fact that they didn't, even, they didn't invest much money in El Salvador at that point. So this story is not only about El Salvador, but it's about the power of corporate, of global corporations to get what they want in, um, in other countries, especially economically poorer ones. So John, tell me about the uh, People's Alliance organizations, ordinary people, uh, extra national people outside El Salvador that you both pulled together to take this on so that in 2017, El Salvador became the first country in the world to ban metal mining. Sure. Well, they asked us for help primarily on researching and putting pressure on the company in Canada, in Australia, and on putting pressure on this tribunal. And so we pulled together a, a really remarkable international set of international allies. Some were the people who, like us, had become involved in Central America back in the 1980s. And there are a number of groups, their sister cities groups and so on. Some were groups that knew about mining and its dangers, environmental groups like, like Greenpeace and the Sierra Club. And some were groups that knew about these trade agreements and these, and these unequal bias tribunals. Uh, most of these groups normally didn't work together, and we pulled them together in the US, Canada, Australia. That was helped by us bringing up, we brought Miguel up, we brought Vidalina up. They did tours, they did education, they did protests outside the corporate headquarters, they did protests and we did outside the World Bank. So this became, if you will, a poster child, this campaign of both what was wrong with mining and what was wrong with these international economic rules. And in the end, the pressure was so strong that the tribunal actually, in one of the rare cases, ruled against the mining company, hooray. 
ask the, I mean, <clears throat> the tribunal said, you've got to pay $8 million, you mining company, back to El Salvador. And in their hubris, they refused to pay. This offended even conservative people in El Salvador. And it created the space whereby the groups on the ground in El Salvador could build support with the Catholic Church, also with very creative, unlikely allies, to actually win a vote in the Salvadoran legislature in 2017 to make it the first country in the world to ban mining. To save and, and of course, we have to talk about the Catholic Church. I mean, it's shades of gray and green all over your story. Um, Tell me more about La Calle. Well, La Calle was the Archbishop, of, uh, the Catholic Archbishop of El Salvador in, in 2009. And part of what's so interesting about the story in terms of the lessons it holds for for other struggles is that the water defenders, as we've described it, it was a community-based social movement that then um, became a national coalition called La Mesa or the Round Table. So they first brought in what we would call the likely allies, the people who they thought would be environmentalists or green or care about um, things like Marcelo being murdered or the death threats, but they realized the water defenders realized that that wasn't a strong enough a, lar a strong and large enough coalition for them to win. So they decided that they had to start reaching out to unlikely allies. Now this was hugely controversial, as you might expect. I mean, think Republicans and Democrats in the U.S., but even more so in El Salvador, which had gone through this horrible civil war from 1980 to 1992. Reaching out to unlikely allies meant reaching out to people who were part of a death squad government. Science Lacaille was the archbishop in El Salvador at that point. The water defenders decided that they needed to try and get the support of the Catholic Church, which is an incredibly powerful opinion maker in El Salvador. And Sainz Lacaille happened to be the archbishop. So he was the logical one to reach out to. The problem was, was not only he was conservative, but he had come from Spain where he was a member of the Opus Dei. Um, some of your listeners may, may know Open Day. Your listeners who know, know that if you want to kick out a global corporation, you would not likely find alliances with an Opus Day member. So um, we tell the story about how Andres and Antonio take the lead in trying to get to Science Lakaya. He is not interested in talking to them. Finally, he agrees to meet with them. He opens the door, as Andres said to us, it was, he seemed like he was going to slam the door on us pretty quickly. He says, I don't care about mining. I don't, I don't really want to meet with you. I don't care about you all water defenders. And then some, for some reason, one of them mentioned the word cyanide. Cyanide was the magic word. They didn't know it. The water defenders didn't know it but Science Lacaille had a degree in chemistry. And he turned, did a 180 degree shift. And he said, if it's something that uses cyanide, I am against it. He didn't join in with them as a unified movement, but he opened the space of the Catholic church, both in terms of his own sermons and pronouncements, as well as encouraging priests around the country to learn more about mining and to give Sunday sermons, homilies against mining. This was an incredibly, incredibly important stage in building a unified alliance, not right versus left, but right versus wrong against mining. And, for and we can only hope that uh, the extraordinary thing is that when it came down to it, the deciding factor was a matter of common sense. They can, lawyers can argue till they're blue in the face, twisting things in and out. But the World Bank's International Centre for Settlement of Investment Disputes, the ICSID, who made the ruling that banned the mining, came down to the conclusion that the mine did not own the land and the landowners did not want the mine. The startling simplicity of this John and Robin, is that you can look at this and see how could any judgment have come down any other way. But actually, your book shows that it was much more complicated than presenting common sense 
and hoping for people to do the right thing. Yes, absolutely. You know what the mining company, the mining company knew that they needed title to the land. The argument, so they tried to do two things. First, they tried to change the mining law. That's usually what a large company would do if it wanted to get around a regulation. Once that proved unsuccessful, they made the argument, and this is, this is again, think, think of this hubris. They said, look, we're just digging underneath your land. You st your houses can still be over the land. You can still farm. We'll just go underneath. It, it was as though they were saying, this is our gold that just happens to be under your land. And thank God that technicality, the court in the end looked at that law, said you didn't do this. There was a brilliant lawyer who became our friend, who was the lawyer of El Salvador, Luis Parada. He brilliantly argued this, made all of these documents public. And so it was a rare unanimous decision of these three tribunalists against the mining company. So hooray on that. Um, but still, El Salvador has not banned mining. So the, that was a fascinating last six months of the fight when all of a sudden they'd won victory one, could they win victory two? And um, again, Robin and I, if we're being totally honest, thought they had not a chance because two thirds of their Congress was conservative parties. It's not like the United States where it's 50-50 in the Senate, it was two thirds. So again, it was their willingness to cross the aisle, to talk to the Mitch McConnell, if you will, of, of El Salvador and pull that person in on this very powerful slogan of water is life. We can live without gold, but we can't live without water. Their willingness to step across the aisle does bear lessons, I think, for all of us, but they won that fight and they won it miraculously, unanimously. The then archbishop told us he thought it was a miracle from God, but Robin and I think it's all of these factors that we've been discussing. And Robin, today. in the last few minutes, Dr. Robin <clears throat> Broad of the School of International Service at American University of Washington, D.C. And you don't just deal with water defenders, El Salvador. I say just, that is no way to belittle it. But I'm trying to say that you are someone with a globalization hat on, an anti-globalization hat, and looking towards the best kind of development and the best minimal impact situations on environments uh, with positive development. What do you think, as we rethink globalization and development and its impacts on the environment, what do you think are the most important points from your book? And I deliberately have not gone into the personalities of development because it reads like a thriller, but I'd have to say, I wish it was a thriller that had never happened. It is beyond me that people thought it was okay to poison people in a country to get money. That there is, is from the very beginning... Uh, criminal is criminal on any scale you like to mention. If it was a man in a court murdering his wife because he had a lover, it would be beyond dispute. So tell me, what is it we have to learn from war to defenders? Well, first of all, to say, to stress your point that it, it is criminal. And even though El Salvador and the water defenders in the end won these two victories, that the fact that it took more than seven years for that court at the World Bank to decide in favor of El Salvador is outrageous. The case should have been thrown out in the beginning. El Salvador should not have had to spend 13 years fighting it. It should not have had to spend $13 million. Um, and the court should not have even had a chance to argue over whether El Salvador's mining law was legal or not. What right is that of a global institution to decide whether a country's law is legal or not? But if we step back from this story and, and ask why it was that these very unlikely victories happened, um, be it about mining or about agribusiness or about something else, I th John and I have, ha um, and we do this in the end of the book, when we move away from the stories to the lessons, there were a number of factors that came together. As, as we say, continue to say, some people might see this as fate. Some people might see it as serendipity. The current archbishop said it was a miracle from, from on high. 
whether or not it was a miracle on hot from on high, it wouldn't have happened without the blood, sweat, tears, and sacrifices of a community-based social movement. So that's the key, the first key lesson is this wouldn't have happened unless you had a community-based social movement that was intent on saving their, their land. Related to that, they on their own framed it in a, a brilliant way that reflected their, their reality. They didn't say we're anti-mining. They said we are pro-water. That's a second key lesson. They framed their fight in a positive way. That positive framing then led to their ability to bring in an alliance, not just of the likely allies, but of the unlikely allies. Mm -hmm. John Cavanna, I must point uh, again in the last few minutes, you wrote a book, Global Dreams, Imperial Corporations of the New World Order. Never has a book been as relevant as it is today. It was a bestseller from Simon & Schuster. You also are an advisor to the Poor People's Campaign. You also co-led a 24-person team to create the International Forum on Globalization, the alternatives to economic globalization. Isn't it true, John Cavana, that people accept globalization and they accept it Please give us some simple ideas. Could you give us some as a senior advisor of the Poor People's Campaign? Sure. Well, what we are finding, I want to say, on the hopeful side right now is that more and more people in the United States and around the world recognize that the form of economic globalization, that where the rules were changed to give corporations free access to cheap labor, all around the world and to exploit the environment, that that approach, which started with Ronald Reagan and, and Maggie Thatcher in the 1980s, what's good for big business will be good for all of us. More and more people are seeing that it's led to grotesque inequality and it's led to terrible environmental problems. So more and more people, and this is across left and right, people, even some Trump supporters think that Wall Street has too much power and are anti-big corporate. So more and more people are stepping up and saying, the rules have been written in a way that are rigged against us. And I think the most important thing for listeners to realize is all these rules are written by people. They can be changed by people. This court that was created that gives all the, the advantages to corporations can be shut down. And a number of governments have left it. Uh, so far, Pakistan, the most recent saying, they, they were hit with a big bill of over $5 billion. They're pulling out of these agreements. So we could make the rules in favor of the corporations just as easily we could make rules in favor of people and the environment. And that's one of the central challenges of our time. And I think more and more, the, the people on the ground in El Salvador are simply a small part of community groups around the world that are saying, this is wrong, we've done it wrong for 40 years, it's destroying people on the planet, let's do it differently. Robin Broad and John Cavana, who are authors of The Water Defenders, the tale of how ordinary people saved a country from corporate greed. Never, never has your story been needed as much as it is now, and I hope people will learn from it and move forward. Thank you very much indeed for speaking to KGNU. Thank you, Claudia. What an honor to be on your show. Thanks so much.